love to preach to you this morning. Amen and amen. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you. <clears throat> Just one more thing. If, if you are new to the ministry and uh, if you are not sure about all the information of the ministry, Please, we have QR scan codes right around the church. So if you need any information, you can just take your phone, switch the camera on, and then scan those QR scan codes on the pillars and at the back, and it will immediately direct you to all the information of the church and of the ministry so that you can look at that and be fully aware of everything that we are doing and what we are planning in this next couple of weeks. So uh, I'm glad to see somebody here this morning. Amen. There were so many of my friends in the ministry and our family members phoning me saying, listen, I would love to be there this Sunday because lately the word was just for me, but I can't be there, but I'll be on the live stream. So all everybody watching by live stream, I know we have so many families from Kamati Puert and we have people from Mozambique watching from Durban, um, Australia, there's so many different areas, and we just say welcome. Can we give them one more warm welcome? Welcome, everybody. All those watching my live stream, we appreciate you, and uh, just tell us where you are watching from, comment in the section, in the comment section, and if you need any prayer, just put it down there. We're going to pray with you and for you, and then for everybody here this morning, if you need any prayer for something specific, and you would love, and, and you would appreciate our teams to pray for you, you can just write down your prayer. We have a prayer wall at the back. You can just stick your prayer into the prayer wall, and during the week, the team and the intercessions uh, and, and all the other people, they will all take the prayer uh, requests that you've put down there. We're going to pray for you and intercede for you. But if you have your Bible, you can turn to 1 John 4 verse 4, just real quick. 1 John 4 verse 4. And there's actually so many things that I want to say this morning, so I'm going to try and contain myself <laughs> and, and, <clears throat> and pace myself. But you can quickly turn to 1 John 4 verse 4. 1 John 4 verse 4. And this morning we also have communion. We had a great week and, and, and last Sunday we had the privilege to baptize quite a couple of people as well. And uh, we preached upon the, the word new life and the higher life. And Jesus spoke about it in, in a certain context. But Jesus spoke to the people and said that if you, if you lose your, your lower life, then you will find your higher life. Amen. But if you, if you find your lower life, then you'll lose the higher life. So Jesus spoke about a higher life, and he spoke about a lower life. And that's what I really feel in my heart that I want to speak again about today, and just add a couple of things in. But before we do that, all the kids, all the children, you're also welcome to go to Children's Church, all the children, all the young ones. So I'm going to speak about that today. And uh, all the kids, you're welcome to go and be blessed at Children's Church. Go and have a good time. They always have a good time. We always hear stories of them in the children's church and what they've been busy with. Thank you to all the teachers as well. We appreciate you. So um, how many of you were blessed last, last Sunday by the word? Did you enjoy the word? We spoke about higher life and the lower life. Um, I believe that there is a higher life. And I believe that the higher life is for each and every single one of us. And, and that God has planned for every single one of us to live in that higher life. So what do I mean by lower life and higher life? Well, Jesus spoke about it. He said, you will find it if you lose your lower life. And most things in the kingdom of God, if you want to live and operate in the kingdom of God, we have to understand that there, there, are, there are contrasts in the kingdom of God. There are paradoxes in the kingdom of God. And I think many of us who have learned and heard of kingdom teachings will understand that the Bible says, if you want to be rich, you have to be poor. Amen. If you want to be lifted up, you have to be made low. If you want to live, you have to die. That is just how everything works with the Lord. Is if you want to have your new life, you have to give away your life. Amen? That's why Paul says, I'm crucified in Christ. No longer I that live, but it is Christ that lives in me. So there are a couple of paradoxes in the Bible. And here Jesus uses one. He says, well, if you want the higher life, you first have to lose the lower life. But if you see the lower life as the higher life, then you're going to lose the true higher life that I have for you. I think the biggest challenge for many of us as, as parents and preachers and pastors and teachers is to, to, to let children reach the, the, the optimal plan for God of their lives. Amen. 
is to see people truly reach their, their goals and truly uh, reach what they can, what they're capable of in their lives. We don't want anybody to live a life that is just normal, just to settle in. You know, there's this quote where a guy says that, that you were made to stand out, not fit in. And I think the Bible tells us clearly that we should not be conformed to the image of this world, but be renewed in the spirit of our minds. So I believe the number one goal that the world has for you is to create a picture of a lifestyle that you're supposed to live. And if you don't live in, in that mold, then for some reason you don't fit in. Praise the Lord for that. You're not supposed to fit in. Amen? Amen? I remember all my friends in matric when we had to go and study, there was a mold. And if you didn't fit into that mold, and for some reason you were a bit weird, you were a bit strange, you did things different than everyone else. But why then do you feel you are more special than everyone else? It's not that you feel you are more special than everyone else. It is just that you are responding to a call that the Lord has upon your life. And many times the call to the prophets and the other men of God was come up higher. How I many of you can remember the stories in the Bible, wherever the Holy Spirit would speak to them, the Bible says, and the Spirit came upon Elijah and lifted him higher. And over and over, you see that passage where the Bible says, and God lifted him higher. I'm praying today, and I've been praying the last couple of weeks, saying, Lord, if my circumstances don't change, then there's only one thing that needs to happen, is that you need to change me. Are you all with me? Sometimes we are so waiting and we are so praying and trusting and asking God, Lord, please change my situation. Where God says, I'm not going to change your situation because I'm busy changing you. <laughs> and, and, and I've realized it so many times that I've prayed for certain things. And then when I know that after a couple of times when I've prayed for things to change, if it doesn't change, I just know that God is not busy changing things around me. He's busy changing me. I have to look at why is the Lord not doing this and this and that for me? Why are these doors not opening up? Why is I'm um, still in this position, still in this place? It's because God is busy doing something within me. Um, we, we all know the story of the prophet that was next to the, the brook. And when he was next to the brook, you know, it, 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 it was um, a time of famine, a time of drought. There were absolutely no rain. Why? Because he prayed for no rain to fall. I want to just look at the situation real quick. So he was sitting next to the river. The ravens and the birds came to feed him, bring him food, and he would drink from the stream. But the Bible says that he realized that the stream, because it hadn't rained for many years, and because I prayed that it should not rain, the Lord heard my prayer, and now it's not raining. And now the stream is drying up. So the man of God realized something had to happen. Are you all with me? Did he pray for rain again? No. So did he pray for his circumstances to change? No. So he could have asked himself the question, did I hear correctly from God? Was I supposed to pray that it shouldn't rain? Because now I'm in a mess. I'm stuck. I'm going to die. If this, if this stream dries up, then I'm going to die. And the prophet could have asked and he could have started doubting, saying, is God even still with me? Did I make a mistake? Should I have not run away? Should I have prayed? Should I have done this? No, God was um, there with him, right there next to the stream. The prophet was exactly where he had to be. He was in God's perfect plan. And sometimes when our, our stream starts drying up, and when we don't see an outcome, when we feel we are stuck, when we feel we have no help, when we feel we have used up all our resources, when we feel there's no open door. Come on, do you, are you here with me today? When you feel that there's no way out of your situation, you say, Lord, did I do something wrong? Am I in the wrong place? Am I in the wrong spot? And the Bible says that the prophet sat next to the stream. He ate, he drank, but now the stream dried up. So... His circumstances didn't change. He didn't pray, Lord, let it rain again, let me have water. He's, the Bible says that the prophet sat and waited upon God. Now, the next thing that happens is very important. And I've preached about this a couple of times this year already. But the next moment, the Bible says, and the word of God came. 
Come on, look at somebody on your left, on your right. Say, and the word of God came. And the word of God came. If somebody's not sitting next to you, look at me. Say, and the word of God came. <laughs> so for me, this was amazing because many times we'll pray and we will ask God. We will, in a way, twist his arm. Lord, if you do this for me, then I'll do that. Lord, if you get me through this month, I promise you, I will... I will commit myself towards your goals. I'll pray at the business every day with all the men. Lord, if you do this, and, and somehow we feel we need to do something, we have to somehow convince God to bless us or somehow convince God to be good to us. While all the while, God has been trying to tell you, just wait upon my word. You are where you need to be today. You are where I've put you. Just because your circumstances are difficult, don't start doubting the purpose and the plan that I have for you. I'm going to say it again. Just because your circumstances might be difficult at the moment, do not doubt what God has put inside of you. Because maybe God is trying to let you look away from everything around you because nothing is changing around you. And maybe he's trying to cause you and to, to help you to focus a little bit more upon what he has put inside of you. And if he has put something inside of you, God will always honor what he has put inside of you. And, and, and you'll receive the next moment, the Bible says, and the word of God came. And that's what I want to pray for you for. You know, the last couple of weeks I've been praying for certain things. And I've been saying, Lord, if circumstances don't change soon enough around certain people, some of my friends, some in the church, I'm saying, Lord, then at least let your word come towards us. Let your word come to us. Let your word speak to us. Let your word change us. And the Bible says, and the word of God came to the prophet, and the prophet arose, the Bible says, arose from that place and walked into the city. Now, the word that the Lord gave to him was that somebody would prepare a meal for him because he was hungry and thirsty. And here he walked into the city, and as he walked into the city, he found the lady, the mother, the widow, they don't have a husband, but a child. And she was bu busy picking up sticks to do what? To prepare one last meal. To prepare one last meal. And the prophet said, prepare for me something to eat and to drink. And she said, sir, I'm going to prepare food for me and my son, and then we're going to die. So she knew it was going to be her and her son's last meal. She didn't have any food left, didn't anything to, have anything left to drink. She was just picking up sticks to make the last meal for her and her son. Now here you see a hopeless situation meets a hopeless situation. <laughs> Are you all with me? And a prophet could have come and said, oh no lady, sorry, I must have heard wrong. You know, I thought the Lord spoke to me. I'm not going to eat you and your son's last meal. <laughs> Far be it from me. I'm a prophet. I'm a man of God. I'm not going to do something like that to you. See, but somehow God sometimes wants us to do those things because when you look at the lady, she must have also felt, I know you're a prophet, but don't you understand? Why will God do this? It's my last meal. I'm, I'm, I, my obligation is to look after my son. I have to look after him. If I don't eat, I'm going to die, and then I can't look after him. But this is going to be our last meal. We're going to have it together. And now you are asking me to give you your food? I have to give my food to you. Now you're telling me that God told you <laughs> to come to me for me to give you food? Come on, just, just quickly put it in today's time. Put it into a Netflix today. Okay? How are you going to react? What are you going to do when that happens, when, when the Word of God comes to you? So the Word of God wasn't a sudden release, a sudden breakthrough and rain fell down. And food just appeared for the prophet to eat. No, he still had to trust in God. He only had a word, but he was acting upon that word of God. And here he went and said, lady, the Lord says. And the next moment, here, she prepares the food. And she gives the food to the prophet. And here, the prophet eats the food. And the next moment, we realize that the prophet <clears throat> received another word from God and he gave another word to the lady. 
and he said, the word of God came to me again. See, so every time when he would be obedient, God would give a word. Are you all with me? Okay, so the next time he gave a word and said, this is what the Lord says, take these jars, go and make them full. And the Bible, to make a long story short, the Bible tells us that because the lady was obedient, she left, she filled the jars, and she had more than enough food. Are you all with me? For longer than a year, she even sold some of it to have funds. So the Lord needed her to be obedient, needed her to sacrifice what she had left in order that he could bless her with more than enough. Are you all with me? And sometimes we, we feel that the Word of God is going to be your release. The, the Word of God might challenge you more than ever before. The Word of God might not just be a sudden breakthrough into everything you prayed for. The Word of God might just be a door for you to break into what you've been praying for. But you have to be obedient to the Word of God. And so that's the word that I felt that I wanted to share with you this morning. Maybe if the circumstances aren't changing, God is trying to create the perfect circumstances for your heart to receive his word. Come on, let me say it again. Are you all with me? Maybe your circumstances have hurt your heart. Maybe your heart is confused. Maybe in your heart you're upset. Maybe you are asking many different questions, saying, Lord, but why this and why that? And, and, and you might be in, in a place where you, you are unsure about certain things. But I want to tell you that the circumstances is just a tool in God's hands to prepare your heart to receive the word. You know, when, you are, when you're a farmer, you have to plow the ground. You have to take out the weeds. You have to take out the rocks. And it's a process. You know, it's not always easy. You have to put nutrients in the ground because if you don't have it in the ground, then you're going to sow your seed and it's not going to grow. If it's too rocky, you're going to sow your seed and it's going to be scorched, the, the, the seed. If, it, if it's too, too many weeds, then the weeds will suffocate the grain when it starts growing. See, somehow God needs to prepare your heart. And I many times ask myself the question, why does the Bible say that the Lord desires a broken and a contrite heart? It's because a heart that is broken and contrite is ready to receive. Are you all with me? It's always ready to receive. So, this morning I know you're all at John, 1 John 4 verse 4. Let's quickly read what it says. It says, little children, you are of God. You belong to him and have already, look at somebody say already, already defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because he who lives in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now, many people, you're Antichrist, everybody thinks about the future. It's not the future. Antichrist is Antichrist. Christ is anointing. Jesus Christ, Jesus the anointed one. Jesus anointed one. So Christ stands for Christos, which stands for anointing. Anointing is, that I, that when Jesus said, I am anointed to preach the gospel, to bind up the brokenhearted. To preach a freedom to the captives. See, there was an anointing upon Jesus because he was anointed to do so. He was anointed to, to set free those who were oppressed. He was anointed to pray for the sick and they received healing. See, it's an anointing. The, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees weren't anointed. Are you all with me? They couldn't do what Jesus did. They couldn't open up blind eyes. They couldn't chase out or dra drive out demons. They did not have the anointing, so they were anti the anointing that Jesus had. Who is this man who can forgive sins? Who is this man that can speak to the winds and the waves? See, there was an anointing upon him. There was power of the Holy Spirit upon him to do, to do these supernatural things. And the others didn't like it. They were anti-Christ, anti the anointing that Jesus had. Are you all with me? So many people are still waiting for the Antichrist. He's, the Bible even says clearly a couple of times that he's already in our midst and have been in our midst for a long time already. Are you all with me? Okay, so it is Antichrist, anti-anointing. And here he says clearly, you have already defeated and overcame them. It is them, not a, a he, it is them, the agents of the Antichrist. Those who are anti-Christ, anti the anointing. For you have already overcome them. Why have you overcome them? Because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Amen? So, so the Bible tells us, once again, 
that there is a new life that we can have and that we have received from Christ. The Bible says there is a higher life. The Bible says in James, we can go and read in John 4, 5. There's so many scriptures. And if you weren't here last Sunday, please go in and listen to the sermon last Sunday. The Bible says, for we have already received everlasting life. Amen? Because we know him. Jesus says, I have come to give you life and life in abundance. Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. Or the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life and life in abundance. So Jesus over and over again tells the people there is a higher life that you can live. There is a newness of life that I give. There is a life that I came to give to you on this earth. If you have not this life, you don't have anything else. Remember last Sunday I said, no chocolate, no braai, no tomati, no sly. Amen. No Jesus, no life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you do not have Jesus, you do not have the life. And here the Bible clearly tells us that you have already overcome. Why? Because you have that new life. What is the new life? It is Jesus in you and you in him. So you have already overcome. And you're not you will overcome or someday you will, but it says, but you will Understand what it means that today you have overcome. Because he who lives in you is greater than he who is in the world. So there is a different kind of life that is in me than the life that is in the world. Jesus says, I have come to give you life and life in abundance. See, what you need to understand and realize is that when, da when, when, when Satan spoke to Adam and Eve in the garden, what did Satan say? He said, surely you will not die if you eat of the tree, but you will only be like God. Is everybody with me? What did God say will happen when they eat of the, of the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? God said, you will die if you eat of this fruit. Your Satan comes and he says, no, <laughs> that's not the truth. You won't die, but you will only be like him and your eyes will open and you will see what God can see. You will be like God. So Adam and Eve believed Satan. They believed that if they would eat of the fruit, they will not die. And they will then be like God. But they did actually die without them even knowing it. See, that is the worst possible death you can die. It is the death that you're not even aware of. I can tell you right now that there are lots of people who call themselves Christians, but who have not yet received the true, genuine life that Jesus came to give. There are many people who are Christians, but they're living the lower life. They're not living the higher life. There are many Christians led by the flesh and not led by the Holy Spirit. See, that is where religion comes in. That's where religion plays a role. Religion is a dead thing. Are you all with me? A relationship <clears throat> makes everything alive. The Bible says that the letter killeth, but the spirit makes alive. So we have many letter Christians. We need more spirit-filled Christians. Come on, are you all with me? See, letter Christians judge and condemn. And, and what, they, what they speak and what they give is death. They minister death. But spiritual Christians give life. Amen? They are happy about Jesus. They are happy to carry the cross, because his cross is light and his yoke is not heavy. Amen? It's a different kind of Christian, different kind of person. But it's a different kind of life that we are supposed to live. But the world wants to force you into its mold, into its way and ideals of living and its way of life. And I realized that soon when the Lord started giving me children. I had many different ideas of how life was supposed to be like, what I've grown up like, what it's like in school and out of school and how to do certain things. But when I, 
the Lord gave me my children, I started looking at life differently. Certain things that was normal to me, but I would always do, I can't force on them because they're different than me. And I started to realize that every child is different than the other one. You see, you get the first child, you think, I've got this. Then you get your second child, and you realize, I don't got this. <laughs> and you realize they are completely different. They like different things. They are different. You, can, you must treat them differently. And then I had three children. And then once again, I had a reality check, and I realized, now it's a boy. He's, he's completely different than all the girls. And then I had the fourth child. And we're not going to have five children, no. We're stopping at four. <laughs> Come on, somebody needs to be fruitful and multiply the earth, and fill the earth, amen? So I realized really soon that, that they are all different. And so in the same way, we are all different. But then it upsets me to know that the world tries its very best every single day to force you into a mold to make us all the same. You can see it through multimedia, you can see it. You can see it through television stations, the radio stations. You can see how the world has a certain way of forcing people in a mold, but then you have the Holy Spirit on the other hand calling you up higher, saying there's a higher life, there's a different life, there's a better life than this. You don't have to be in it, you can be above it. There's a big difference, and, and, the, and, and the example we can use is the example of the eagle that lived with the chickens. The eagle never knew what it was like to fly, even if it had wings. Never knew what it would be like to be up in the sky in the clouds because its mentality was to be on the ground with the chickens. Until the eagle could see other eagles fly over and realize, hey, but I look like those eagles. I make the same noise as those eagles. I'm not supposed to fit in with the chickens. I'm supposed to fly above in the air. Are you all with me? I'm supposed to be there. And so the, the eagle needs a revelation. The eagle needs an awakening. It needs, it needs to see what it can be and who it can be. And that's why it's so important. The Bible says a city on a hill cannot be hidden. That's why if we call ourselves Christians, we should be above circumstances. Amen. We should live different than the world. I, I always use an example. Pastor Latanya once preached about it. She said, if we look like the world, speak like the world, then where will the world go to get saved? If all Christians look like chickens, then where will the chickens go to learn flying lessons? You see, we need to see something. We need to be examples for our children, what it means to, to live the higher life, what it means to be led by the Holy Spirit. If they don't see that example, they will never be felt or never have the desire to be higher. Are you all with me? And I'm using the word higher because God says in Isaiah 55, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And we said, so how can we get these higher thoughts? How can, how, can, how can we get these higher ways? The Bible says, only the spirit of a man knows the thoughts of a man. And then it says, but we have received the spirit of God to know the thoughts of God. So how can I know the thoughts of God? How can I live this higher life? If you recap on last week, it's when I have the spirit of God. It's when I have the spirit of God. He will equip me. He will help me. He will lift me higher. He will show me what it means to fly. He will show me what it means to use my wings. Are you all with me? He, he will show me that my eyes can see further than the chickens. He, can, he will show me that I can soar in the air for hours. He will teach me something different. He will show me a different kind of life. But if we always just live the life of the flesh and every day just live to look after my flesh, Every day just left to feel okay today. I'm so just catering for my flesh and my impulses and my emotions. I'm not being led by the Spirit. Then I'm going to be put in a mold. Now, <clears throat> we just read 4 verse 4. Quickly turn to Hebrews 9 verse 7. Hebrews 9 verse 7. But before we go there, let's go to Romans 8, just real quick, Romans 8. I 
And I realized that scripture is so amazing. And, and, and it's not just for you to win a battle. It's not just for you to not be scared or not to be afraid. The scripture says, for, for you have already overcome. Number one, you have to realize that you're not going to overcome. So many people see it that way. Doesn't matter what comes against me, I'm going to overcome it because the one that is in me is greater than the one that's in the world. That's, the scripture doesn't say that. The scripture says that you have already overcome. Are you all with me? It says you have already overcome because the one that is in you is greater than the one that is in the world. It doesn't say you will overcome soon because the one that is in you is greater than the one that is in the world and will soon overcome the one that is in the world. <laughs> Are you all with me? It says, <laughs> you have already overcome because greater is the one that is in you than the one that is in the world. You have already overcome. Come on, do you believe that you have already overcome? Do you believe that if you believe in Christ, you have already received that life? Many people believe that they receive eternal life when they die one day and go to heaven. That is not when you receive eternal life. You already have eternal life. And only when you pass away, death no longer has power over you. That is why you go to heaven, because you already have eternal life. Are you all with me? See, there's there, there certain ways that, uh, that you need to look at this, because it will completely change your perspective. It will, it will change your perspective in such a way that the day you will know you're an overcomer. You will not live every day and pray every day and hope every day to overcome your circumstances. See, I'm not trying to be victorious. I'm already victorious. See, I've trained very, Jesus trained very hard and he already won the Olympics on, in my place. And he gave me the gold medal. I have already overcome. I have already won the prize. Are you all with me? I'm not going to. I don't need to prove anything to anyone. I already have victory because I have already won. Why? Because he that is in me is greater than the one that is in the world. No one else can beat him. He won the gold medal. Are you all with me? He already won. And he is inside of me. He chose to be one with me. So if he was victorious, that makes me victorious because I share in his victories. Are you all with me? Are you all with me? <laughs> okay, okay. So <clears throat> one thing, before we read Romans 8, one thing that I realized was in this week we went to Harbis Purdam. And we, it was something that Aisha had on her bucket list. We wanted to do it for a long time, but now the kids were old enough. So we took them to the elephant sanctuary. And when we got to the elephant sanctuary, they said, okay, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go in, you will feed the elephants, and then you will stand next to them, and you can touch them, and then you can take photos with the elephants. So I thought, man, this is amazing. And I asked him morning, I said, do you know how big they are? And he showed me a picture and said, yeah, that's how big they are. I said to him, okay, now you will only realize how big they are when you stand next to them. And so it was so amazing to see how they, the kids weren't scared at all. Come on, if you go to the bush felt and you see an elephant about four meters high, you're going to run. Amen? You're, you're going to run. You're going to get away as soon as possible. Even if the one that is in you is greater than one. <laughs> because you're not supposed to be there, okay? So we stood there and, and they fed the elephant and the elephant ate. And the next moment we went in and he, they went through a little course. And he said, okay, so the trainers will stand next to the elephants and they will speak to them and the elephants will obey them. So just listen to what the trainers tell you to do. So I was standing there and Aisha went with, with um, Inga and Monique first. And I saw them standing next to the elephant. And they touched the elephant and the trainer said, okay, I lift up your leg, and he would lift up his leg, and they will touch his leg and his foot, and the trainer will say, okay, um, I'm going to touch your tail, and then the elephant is okay with that, and the kids could touch the elephant, touch the tail, he even opened up his mouth, let them see his teeth, you know, they could touch his trunk and his ears, and he was just like a little lamb. This massive animal that you will normally never get close to. 
He just woke up and touched it as if it's a small little lamb. You're not scared at all. I even saw the other ladies. At first they were scared. And the trainer said, don't worry. You will listen to me. Come and touch the elephant. And then the ladies would go and they would touch the elephant. They would not even have a trace of fear. And I stood there and I realized the only reason why everybody will go and touch the elephant is because they know that the elephant has been overcome. Are you all with me? Is that the elephant has been overcome. The elephant submits to the trainer. So as long as the trainer is there, then I'm going to be okay. I can touch the elephant. I can touch his leg. I can touch his horn. I can do whatever I want to. And the elephant's going to be okay with me because the trainer is there. And I realized that even my kids would normally never get close to an elephant. Of course not. But because the trainer is there, they will go and touch him. They won't be scared at all. So actually, everybody that goes to touch the elephant have a lot of faith in the trainer. Are you all with me? They completely trust them. If he says it's okay, it's okay. And when I went to go and stand there, for some reason the elephant tried to be funny. So I would touch his leg and he would, once would even bump me and he would turn his head towards me and the trainer would say, yeah, and his name was Musa or something. Musa, no, 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 no. Stop playing, stop playing. So he tried to play with me. I don't know why. So every time the trainer would speak, the elephant would obey. And I thought there's no reason for this massive big elephant to obey this small trainer. But he's he's been he's been trained for years since he was small because he's as old as me, the elephant that I stood next to, 37 years old. He was the same age as me. But the man said from a small age he was trained to be obedient to the trainers. And the reason he's obedient is because they feed him every time he's obedient. Come on, I'm getting somewhere today. It's because they will give him food. If he doesn't listen, they will take food away. If he listens, they give him food. So they train him by giving him food. Even the seals and dolphins, they, if they do something right, you have to give them something. And it's just as if a revelation came into my mind. First of all, the one that is in you is greater than the one that is in the world. The trainer was greater than the elephant. And we had so much faith in the trainer that we were not scared to get close to the elephant. We knew the elephant won't do anything to us because the trainer is there. It almost makes me think about the, the, the disciples when they were on the boat. I mean, Jesus spoke and he said, the winds and waves calm down. They were all felt safe because, hey, Jesus is there. <laughs> Amen. As, just lo- as long as I've got Jesus in my boat, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to reach the other side. Are you all with me? In the same way, what faith do we have? Do we truly understand what it means? Because there's a big difference in, in knowing you are free and being set free. See, many of us can know the truth. And, and, and I can be told the truth. But the only way I can experience it for myself is when I believe it. When I start to do it. I can tell a slave what freedom is. And just because he knows what freedom is, doesn't set him free. Those prison doors need to open. His sentence needs to be taken away. Then he is truly free. Otherwise, you're not free. So we can know all the truths in the Bible, but it might not even have any effect in your life. See, I can tell you, you are more than an overcomer. Through Christ, that strengthens you. Who is he that overcomes but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Come on, I can quote all these scriptures. All of us can say, yeah, I'm an overcomer. Yes, greater is he that is in me than the one that is in the world. But you live every day as, as if everything is above you and you're not above anything else. Every day you fall back in cycles. Every day you fall back into addictions. Every day which we start looking for different outcomes, different things to help us. But instead... We get tired and we get weary because we never live as people who have truly overcome. See, Prophet Joey, when he was here a while ago, he preached and he said, I'm not living for victory. I'm living from victory. There's a huge difference. I'm not fighting every day to get victory. I realize today that I am victorious and I'm living from victory. See, there's a difference. If you have conquered a city, 
you will live differently. Are you all with me? If, you, if, you've, if you've won a war, you will live differently. You're not going to walk uh, as if you're hiding away from everybody in that city. You're going to live and you're going to walk around and say, hey, I've overcome this city. I've overcome this town. We have won the war. Amen. And Jesus explains it. He says that I've given you all power and authority. And sometimes our problems might be as big as these elephants around us, but God says the authority that I've given you will cause your circumstances and problems around you to obey your voice when you start speaking. See, you will only start speaking to your situation if you believe you're more than an overcomer. Otherwise, you always just know it and you will never do something about it until you get tired of it. See, last Sunday I posted a small message and I said, whatever you see as normal, you will never have a desire to be set free from. Whatever you see as normal, but it's always been this way. And God says, but it has never been supposed to be that way with me. I've always been depressed, but I've never meant for you to be depressed. I've always been sick my whole life. I've never meant for you to be sick your whole life. There's always fights in my family. I never planned for fights to always be in your family. See, and, 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 and I said to him, you know, you just spoke about many different things the last couple of weeks. And I spoke to Pastor Latanya and I said to her, you know what? For me, one of the secrets to step into new, the new things that God has for you is for you to start hating what is evil and to love what is good. That is, in a way, how we get ourselves out of the mold. See, whatever you tolerate, you just get used to it. Have you ever been in your house for, for about a year or two years, and there was something small you were supposed to fix, but you overlooked it the whole time? <laughs> Until somebody comes to visit you and say, hey, what happened there? And you're like, oh, man, I forgot about that. Anybody else here today? Just me? Do your wife also remind you every now and again, hey, uh, you remember you missed that? We were supposed to fix that last year. <laughs> but just because you see it every day, you just get used to it and used to it. And so in the same way, when we do wrong things, we just get used to doing the wrong thing, you know, and it becomes normal to us. And then you no longer have a desire to be set free from it because I've always done this. Come on, are you with me? I've, I'm used to this. It's always been like this in my family. We've always done this. But why, why do you tell me it's wrong? And sometimes when people come and tell you, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. You get offended. Why not? I've always done this. And they will tell you because it's not good for you. See, there's certain things that we've been eating for years until they, they, the scientists go and do tests on it and then come and tell you, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, don't eat that anymore. That's not healthy for you. Are you all with me? And then all of a sudden, all the food fanatics, we can't eat that anymore. We'd rather replace this with this. Replace that sugar with this. Or don't drink that coffee anymore. Drink this. Or do this. Wie van jullie het geweet dat het vis meer weggevat? That was horrible. <laughs> they say that's good news. Yeah, for those who don't eat it, who needs to smell the breath of the other one who did. <laughs> but for me, it was what I was used to eating it in my home, in my mom's house, every Sunday afternoon, a toast, a fish spread, tomato, and salt and pepper on it with a cup of tea. Every Sunday night. I was so used to it. Now I'm told they're not going to make it anymore. It's taken off the shelves, and it's like, what? I loved it. <laughs> I wouldn't marry then. Well, that might, might be why I loved it. But there are other foods also being discontinued because people realized, hey, that's not good for you. But you know what? That is what the Word of God does. You've been doing things your whole life until you read in the Word of God and then suddenly you realize, hey, I'm not supposed to do that. Hey, I've been put in a mold that the world has put me in. Hey, why am I still doing that? Hey, why do I still believe this? See, we need the Word of God to challenge the way we live. Church should not be a place where you go to and just feel great about yourself and then go home. Church should be a place where you get challenged. Are you all with me? Where you get challenged to, to be better every single day. Okay, now Romans 8. Are you also at Romans 8? 
So I want to say it again. Just because you are aware of something doesn't mean you possess it. So let's read 8 verse 1 just real quick. Okay, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ? Is he in you? Yes, because greater is he that is in you and the one that is in the world. So if he that is in you is greater than what is in the world, then don't desire what the world can give you. Desire what the one can give you that is greater than the world. Are you all with me? Okay, so Mon, how can I get the greater things of the one who is greater? I don't want what the world can give me. I want what he can give me. See, John says, if, if, if you love the world and love God, then you are a liar. Because you cannot love the world and love God. Because if you love the world, then the love of God is not in you. If you hate your brother and say you love the other, the Bible says then you are a liar because you cannot hate your brother and say you possess the love of God. See, just because I know of the love of God doesn't mean I possess it. I really hope I'm going to set somebody free today by this message. Just because I know that Christ has overcome the earth doesn't mean I'm already an overcomer. So the things that I know doesn't mean I possess it. I have to do something to possess what I know. Okay? <clears throat> so it says, for we're in Christ Jesus, who live. Now, number one, it says, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the Spirit. Now, you hear what it says? For the law of the Spirit of life. Look at somebody say life. Jesus says, I have come to give you life. And life in abundance. The law could not give us life. Let me say it again. Devet, the law, could not give you life. That's why Jesus said, I have come to give you life. The law cannot give you life. Hear what it says. For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being, has freed me from the law of sin and death. Okay, so I belonged to the law of sin and death. Today I can tell you, if I do everything perfect according to the Ten Commandments that was given to us, or the Israelites, if I rephrase, the law that was given by Moses, if I do everything perfectly well and I don't sin at all from now on for the rest of my life, I still will not go to heaven if I don't have Jesus. I still will not have eternal life. See, that's why it's called the law of sin and death. The law was only given to you to show you that you can't do it by yourself, that you need Jesus. The law was only given to you to prepare you to receive Jesus. And I'm going to prove it to you just now, okay? So it says, so <clears throat> the law that Jesus came to give me, has freed me from the law of sin and death. You know, once I was in a church, I think it was in, 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 in Alstrom somewhere, and I preached, and I said to everybody, people, how many of you are still living under the law and sin and death? Have you truly been freed from that law? See, it doesn't just happen. You need to be set free. You have to be freed from that law. So that you can live the law of the Spirit. But you have to be set free from that law. You know, the sad thing is, you need to preach upon, on grace over and over again. Every quarter, you have to remind people, hey, you have been given grace. Hey, your price has been paid. Hey, Jesus took all your sin upon himself. Jesus paid once and for all for your sin. You are holy. You are blameless in Christ Jesus. You have a new life. You have a new being. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have become new and all things have passed. Hey, the, the, the law of the spirit of life has freed you from the law of sin and death. Are you really free from the law of sin and death? Or every now and again, do you feel, still feel judged? Every now and again, do you still feel not good enough? Every now and again, do you still feel not worthy, not holy enough? Come on, are you set free from that law? Because it's the law. And you need to be set free from it. You don't get upgraded from the law of sin and death 
to the law of spirit of life. You first of all have to get set free from the law of sin and death. So that you can receive the law of the spirit of life. What is the law of the spirit of life? What is this new life that Jesus came to give us? You hear what it says? For God has done, and this is actually so amazing. I don't even have to read anything else today. Just hear what the scripture says. For God has done what the law could not do. Are you all with me? For God has done what the law could not do. It's power being weakened by the flesh. Now, flesh, I mean, sometimes if you hear people say, yeah, but the flesh, the spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak, brother. (laughs) How many have ever heard that? At a time in the church, I think in the 2000s, it was always flesh. We were in this battle with flesh. Battle, I'm fighting the battle of flesh. And, and, And I realized soon, but then you don't know who you are. Because you have already overcome. Why are you fighting your flesh if you have already overcome? Maybe the devil just painted a picture and created a trap for people to get stuck fighting the flesh, not realizing that they've already overcome the flesh. So years out of the church. Why? Because Satan taunted us to fight our flesh. (laughs) That was when the Lord woke me up one morning. He said, stop killing a dead man. I started crying. I said, Lord, what do you mean? He said, Yamon, stop killing the previous Yamon you were. Stop trying to fix the mistakes the previous Yamon did. He is dead. He is in the grave. And you rose up in a new life together with me. Stop killing the dead man. What are you busy with? Come on, I hope I set somebody free just now. But let's go back to the scripture. It says, the flesh is what? What is flesh? For God has done what the law could not do, its power being weakened by the flesh. Flesh, in brackets and amplified, it says, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit. Plain and simple. It is plain and simple answer. Flesh is not doing this or this wrong habit or saying the wrong things. It's, that's just symptoms of living without the Holy Spirit. That is what the flesh is. And here, Paul, like the word of God is like a dividing sword. It divides flesh from bone. And here the word of God comes and it wants to divide what is good, what is evil. What you should hate and what you should love. What you should reject and what you should run after. See, the word of God does that so that you don't live in a life where everything is acceptable and everything is normal. And you cannot be set free from what you see as normal. See, the world wants to make everything normal. The world wants to make everything acceptable. And if you say, I don't accept that, I don't accept this for my family, I don't accept this for my child, or for my brother, or my sister, I don't accept this for my house. There's a reason why Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can make everything else normal. You can accept everything and allow all sin to run rampant in your homes. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's a line, there was a distinction that he had, and he said, I will not allow that in my family. I will not allow this in my children. They will not watch these shows. They will not say these things. They will not do this. This is my house, and we will serve the Lord. See, the goal of the devil is to make everything normal is to normalize everything. You need to accept everything. I love all people, but I hate sin. I love everybody, but I'm not going to accept what you are doing. I'm not going to approve of your lifestyle. I love you, but I will pray that you get set free from what what the devil has on you. See, the world wants to create this picture that everything is acceptable. And if you stand up against it, you say, I don't approve of that, they see you as being judgmental. You're not judgmental. Just in the same way as the world can approve everything, you can also have your say. Nothing wrong with that. That's why we are given given the word of God to show us how our lives should be governed. And the world is fleshly. Why? Because the world lives without the Holy Spirit. 
is not led by the Holy Spirit. That's why the only thing the world can do is to put you in its created mold. Do you see? The world puts you in its mold. The Holy Spirit comes and He leads you. What does He do? He leads you out of that mold that the world is trying to put you into. He lifts you up out of the ideals and circumstances of the world so that you can live above it. Come on, are you all with me? Are we getting somewhere today? Okay. So it says, <clears throat> it is the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit. Now verse, the second part of the verse says, sending his own son in the disguise of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. God condemned sin in the flesh, subdued, once again, overcame, say overcame. And then secondly, you have to understand, deprived, say deprived. Eat of its power over all who accept that sacrifice. So God has deprived the power of sin over your life if you accept the sacrifice of Jesus. So what it says here is that all of us know that the effects of sin leads to death, sickness, disease. But the Bible says, but if you accept the sacrifice of Jesus... God will remove the effects. <laughs> oh, this, is, this is so beautiful. Come on, if you can believe it, then you can receive it. He has deprived it of its power over all. So the Bible says that God has deprived sin of its power to harm you. Why? Because you are in Christ. Why? Because you are living the higher life. Do you need to go on? Verse 4, so that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Might be fully met in us who live, number one, who live and move not in the ways of the flesh, but in the ways of the spirit. Now, to mean live in the spirit means, you know what it says, our lives governed not by the standards and according to the dictates of the flesh, but controlled by the Holy Spirit. See, the world forces you into a mold, but the Holy Spirit controls you into a newness of life. See, many people don't like to be, don't like to be controlled. And when they think about the Holy Spirit, they think, yeah, but he's free. The Holy Spirit is free. Yes, he is free. But he wants to control you. And many few people truly, they just feel, I want, want him to lead me today. Or lead me in doing this. Or lead me in doing that. No, no, he wants to control you. That's why you need to surrender to the Holy Spirit. I know that you've surrendered to Jesus. I know that you are born again. But now still, while you are on this earth, there is a higher life. And Jesus came to give it to you. But if you want to experience that life, the only way you can experience that life is when you are led by the Holy Spirit. That's what you need to see here. Paul says, I know you're born again. Okay, I know that you will go to heaven one day. Yes, it is all proven. It is all given. But in order for you to live the higher life, you need to experience this newness of life of Jesus. And the only way is to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because even if you are a Christian, even if you are born again and you're not led by the Holy Spirit, you will not experience what it means to be set free from sin. You will not experience to see what it means to be led and controlled by the Holy Spirit. But even if you're a born again Christian, the world will still try and fit you into its mold. Come on, if the devil can keep you busy, it doesn't have to destroy you. If he can keep you in the world's mold, you are no threat to him. But when you are led by the Holy Spirit, then all hell starts to tremble. It's a newness of life. <clears throat> For those who are according, verse 5, to the flesh and controlled by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. So what did we say was the missing link? For who knows the thoughts of God but the Spirit of God? 
We have received the Holy Spirit, and now we know his thoughts. How do we know the thoughts of God? We have the Holy Spirit of God. And when we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, he shows me the thoughts of God. And now here the Bible says that if we are led astray by the flesh, then our minds will continually be filled by the things of the flesh. So that means I'm living the lower life. But when I'm controlled by the Holy Spirit, I start living the higher life. I have different thoughts. Now, give us, <clears throat> no, let's go on. It says, <clears throat> and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit, set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. Now, the mind of the flesh is deaf, but the mind of the Holy Spirit is life, and soul peace, both now and forevermore. That is, in verse 7, because the mind of the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit itself to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. I can go on and on. Verse 8, so then those who are living the life of the flesh cannot please or be acceptable to God. Verse 9, it says, But you are not living the life of the flesh. You are living the life of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit of God really dwells within you, directs and controls you, but if anyone does not possess the Holy Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Then again, verse 10, there's so many, you have to see how many times Paul will say, but, but, but. In verse 9, but. In the second part, but. Verse 10, but. Verse 12, but. Verse 13, but. It's the whole time he says, but, but, but. The only reason why he will say, but, but, is because there's a revelation that people need to get. And I said it earlier, and I, I will even close here today. If I just know that you're receiving what I'm trying to say today. The reason why Paul is saying this the whole time is because he wants to convince you. The reason why Paul uses the word say, really. If the Holy Spirit really dwells in you. Because some will say that they are led by the Holy Spirit, but every day they are living the life of the flesh. Jesus said, if you really love me, then you will do what I say. Come on, there's so many of us on, on the scale, some days doing what we need to and other days not doing it. Some days led by the Holy Spirit, other days not led. So Paul even says, if you are really, really <laughs> led by the Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying this to cause you to doubt. I'm saying this to put a hunger in your heart saying, Holy Spirit, I want to be led by you. Maybe the reason why I've been around the chickens my whole life is because my mentality is fleshly. Because I'm led by the things of the flesh. Maybe I need to, the help of the Holy Spirit to open up my eyes and once and for all get out of the sickness. Once and for all get out of this depression. Once and for all get out of these problems. But I need the Holy Spirit's mind. I need to be led by the Holy Spirit. Let's quickly just read on. But if, verse 10, if Christ lives in you, then even though your natural body is dead by sin and guilt, the Spirit is alive because of the righteousness that He gives to you. Verse 13 says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Hear what he says. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are putting to death the evil deeds prompted by the body, you shall really and genuinely live forever. The passage here says that when we are led by the flesh, what, what is the flesh? The flesh is sense and reasoning without the Holy Spirit. 
The flesh is just you doing what you'd want to do every day and not being obedient to the Holy Spirit that God has given you. The Holy Spirit is not a threat to you. I've seen so many people say, yeah, but it's so hard, you know, to, because the flesh is so strong and it's so hard for me to, to always be obedient to what the Holy Spirit says. And I don't always know when he speaks to me and, and, and I, I just, it's sometimes just so hard to be a good Christian, you know, and, 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 and God wants me to do this and I feel, I have to do, but I don't know if I can do that. The Holy Spirit is not your enemy. The only reason why he will be an enemy to you is, is when your flesh, <laughs> when your flesh is stronger in your own heart than the Holy Spirit, and you think, I want to feed my flesh. But the Holy Spirit requires me to leave that addiction. The Holy Spirit requires of me to start speaking right. The Holy Spirit works in me and he says, don't do that anymore. Don't say that anymore. Don't think these things anymore. The Holy Spirit is calling me up to a higher life the whole time. But the flesh wants to pull me back into its mold the whole time. That's what the scripture here says. That by the help of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death the life of the flesh. Are you going to walk out of this building today and then be led by the Holy Spirit completely? The scripture here says that habitually you have to put to death the desires of the flesh. And do what the Holy Spirit requires of you. So the Bible says that when I walk in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will every day walk with me and tell me, don't do that. That is not my will for you. Don't think this about yourself. Don't allow those thoughts into your mind. That is not my thoughts. Don't accept this sickness. You're set free from the sickness. Come on, how many of you want the higher life today? You want to live in a higher life, the life of purpose, living a life intentionally. Come on, we've been preaching on it saying intentional. We believe in being intentional. And today we are intentionally saying, Holy Spirit, come and lead me today. I'm tired of the life of the flesh. The life of the flesh. See how the devil fools things? See, he, he wants you to, and, and many children, young people, he wants, to, he wants to cause us to think that the life of the flesh is everything you need. And when you talk about the Holy Spirit, it feels like the Holy Spirit is your enemy. Because the love of the flesh gives you all these things and gratifies you, makes you feel good. And like the elephant, the elephant would only obey if you would feed him. So how will your flesh keep on obeying you is if you keep on feeding your flesh. Until you stop feeding your flesh. And until you surrender more to the Holy Spirit. You mind, but how can I do it? Create time to do it. In the mornings, wake up. Before you do anything else, go and kneel at your bed. Say today, Holy Spirit, I don't want to be led by the flesh. I don't want to be put into a mold that the world creates. I don't want to be put into a mold that flesh creates. But Holy Spirit, I want to be led by you today. Holy Spirit, give me your thoughts. Fill me. Flood me today. Lead me, Holy Spirit. Let me be a city on a hill today. Amen. Let me give a word to someone today. Let me reach out to someone today. You know, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Flesh forces you. The Holy Spirit controls you, but He controls you with love and compassion. He will never force you to do anything. I remember many times when I would just sit and prepare. I would sit and I would pray. And I would, take, I would speak to the Holy Spirit. And the next moment, I would see somebody's face in front of me. And the Holy Spirit would put a desire in my heart to phone that person. And one night, as I was praying, I felt the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I saw the person's face. And I felt the Holy Spirit said to me, phone him now. And I looked at my watch and I thought, ah, but it's already 10 o'clock. It's very late. He said, phone him now. So I took my phone and I phoned that person. I said, hey. I've got a scripture for you. It's, I think it was Psalm 36. And, and I read a passage to him. And the man was busy driving in his car. And he burst out in tears. And he said, Jamon, you, you have no idea 
what I was going to do right now before you phoned me. And he said, but I'll have to go now. I'll talk to you a bit later. A couple of weeks ago, he phoned me. He said, Jamon, that night, 10 o'clock, when you phoned me, when you gave me that scripture, you know it's my favorite scripture. Nobody knows that. And I was busy driving in my car, and I was shouting out to God, saying, God, if you still love me, if you still have a goal for me, if you still have purpose for my life, then let somebody phone me now and give him my favorite scripture. <laughs> Next moment, his phone, his phone rang. It was me giving him his favorite scripture. He was about to drive into a truck, take his own life. He was about to kill himself that night. After he said that, I fell, I, I fell on my knees when he phoned me and I was in my office. I started crying. I said, Jesus, thank you. Holy Spirit, thank you that, that you spoke to me that night. See, sometimes we are so busy with useless things. Do you see how effective just one minute with the Holy Spirit can be in your life? Do you see how just one minute with the Holy Spirit can save a whole family's life because the Holy Spirit saved that father's life? His whole family would have been in ruins, but the Lord saved his life that night. It's because somebody, I'm not boasting in myself, not at all, I'm trying to motivate you. I'm just saying because I was willing just to hear his voice that night. I was willing just to create time. I know another man of God, you know, we, we sat in my office once and we spoke about the Holy Spirit. And he said, Jamon, lately, if I would, I would pray, I would pray for about two hours in the Spirit. And he said, I haven't done it for a long time, but lately I started doing it more and more and I can't pray enough. And the service was so amazing, the Holy Spirit moved and he sat there and he said, Jamon, you know what, the one time I prayed for two hours and I, and I said, I have to go and eat now. And I went out of the door and it was as if the Holy Spirit cried. I said, I just want some more time with you. Come back into the room. I want to I wanna talk to you. And he said, he felt that desire and he turned around and went into his room again, locked the door and he prayed. He said, he so enjoyed just speaking to the Holy Spirit the whole night. See, that desire must come back into our hearts. Sometimes we get so busy with the things of the world that we forget about the one who overcame the world. Can we all stand together? And the wonderful thing about this is that the Bible says the life is in the blood. I said this last Sunday. Oh man, I can just feel the Holy Spirit in this place right now. Whew. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I spoke about it last Sunday and I said that the Israelites, they were not allowed to drink of the blood of the animals because the life was in the blood. So the only way that God could send us everlasting life the life of Jesus, the life of the Word of God, the life of the Holy Spirit, the higher life, the only way He could bring it to us was to put that life in the DNA of the blood of Jesus. So Jesus, who was the Word of God, had to become flesh. As the Bible says, God has put Jesus in sinful guise, a disguise of flesh, so that He could bring us life. So the life of Jesus is hidden in the blood of Jesus. And this will remind you of the scripture where the people said, far be it from us that we will drink of your blood and eat of your body. And Jesus said what? He said, if you don't drink of my blood, if you don't eat of my body, you have no part in me and I have no part in you. But Paul says, you have received Christ. You have been born again. But people, I'm urging you today, I want to tell you, that there is a life. There is a life. See, we all watch these movies of these treasures hidden somewhere, of these secret islands that people, nobody knows of. And people will dedicate their lives to find these treasures or find these islands. But you know what the Bible speaks about in Matthew 12 and Matthew 11, 13? It speaks about a man who walked on a field and found a treasure and in his joy went and sold everything he had to purchase the land containing the treasure. 
And we always use ourselves as an example saying, we came to this earth and we found a treasure. We found the kingdom of God on this earth. And we are willing to give our lives to live in his kingdom. But don't, don't you know that Jesus was also that man who walked on this earth in the field. But he, when he walked in the field, he found a treasure hidden in the field. Do you know that the treasure is us? That Jesus found in the world, the field. And in his joy, he went to go and sell everything he had. Jesus died on the cross, gave everything he had to do what? To possess not just a treasure, but the whole field. He's got the whole world in his hands. It belongs to him. The treasure is the kingdom. The treasure is the life in the kingdom. The treasure is the life led by the Holy Spirit. That is the treasure. And we have it right here. We can possess it. We can possess it. Just because you know of it doesn't mean you possess it. So today, how are we going to possess it? The only way that it's possible to possess the Son, to possess righteousness, the only way is to surrender. The only way is to surrender. How did you receive Jesus? You surrendered. How did you receive the Holy Spirit? You surrendered. It is not about you doing something. It's about you surrendering. How do we receive healing? Not by being holy enough, by surrendering. How do we receive joy? Not by earning it, but by surrendering. There's a huge difference. With God, everything is about surrender. So today, we're going to surrender. The same way we did when we, ex we accepted the life of Jesus. Now we're going to receive the control of the Holy Spirit today. I've never done it this way, but I'm going to do it that way today. And we're going to pray. Come on. Before we have communion today, I want us to do it. Just there we are. Just close your eyes. And I'm going to, we're going to start this step. Amen. And from today on, we are going to habitually put the flesh to death and be led by the Holy Spirit and be controlled by the Holy Spirit more and more. So come and pray after me. Lord Jesus, you can put your hand on your belly. Your belly is a spirit man. Just pray after me. Lord Jesus. Thank you that today I can make a decision to surrender to you, Holy Spirit. I renounce the life and the desires and the impulses of the flesh. I pray that it will no longer be able to offer anything to me or to control me or to lead me astray but I surrender to you Holy Spirit <laughs> lead me guide me control me Holy Spirit let me have the mind of Christ the mind of my Father and also His thoughts so that I can do Your will. In Jesus' name, I pray. Come in, if you believe that you receive, that just clap your hands. Come on, let's say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for a newness of life. A newness, a newness, a newness of life. Come on, just say it over yourself. Just put your hand on your heart and say, Jesus, thank you for a newness of life. Just declare it. Come on, you need to believe it. I declare it today in Jesus' name, a newness of life. The old things have passed, the new things have come. I am more than an overcomer through Christ that strengthens me. Come on, I am the righteousness of God. I am born again. The same spirit that is in God that raised Jesus from the dead is also within me. Today, I'm led by the Holy Spirit. No more flesh me thoughts, but led by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you, Lord. I just quickly want to read 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10 to you. And we're going to have communion. And then we're going to go home today and have a good holiday tomorrow. But before we close the meeting, before we have communion, and before we sit with our families, usually as a custom, we would drink and eat all together. But I really started enjoying it, doing it with my family, and I think everyone else. So today when we close, you're welcome to come to the front, take a cup, take a piece of bread, and go and sit with your family, sit with your children, and have communion with them. If you are here alone, find somebody that's also here alone today, and go and sit with them, and spend time with them. Before we do that, the scripture here says to Corinthians 9 verse 10, that thus you will be enriched in all things and in every way so that you can be generous and your generosity as it is administered by us will bring forth thanksgiving to God. Verse 10 says, and God who provides seed for the sower and bread for the eater will also provide and multiply your resources for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So the Bible says that God gives seed to the sower and, and bread to the eater. And it says and that God will multiply and produce and give each and every single one of us that which we need. And today I want to proclaim that over you. Amen. I want to proclaim that if it's in your season that you need seed, that God will give you seed. If you're in a place right now where you need bread, that God will supply you with bread. Amen? But don't eat your seed and sow your bread. Seed needs to be planted because seed can reproduce. Bread cannot reproduce. It can only fill. Bread is only temporal. But seed, when you sow it, keeps on giving seed and keeps on growing. That is how God designed it. So unless a seed is sown, it cannot bring forth a harvest. And, and in our church, we, we don't take up an offering. We create an opportunity for you to give. And we, I remember once there were people here for the very first time. And I said, come, let's sow your seed. And the wife said, we didn't bring any seed. And he said, no, it's, it's money. He meant money. We need to sow money, not see. <laughs> so so she, she was here for the first time in this church. And she, she thought that the next time she'll bring some seed with <laughs> to come and sow. But we call it seed because the Bible calls it seed. And we receive it, but you need to sow it. Amen. So today, I want to take out your seed. If you brought any seed here today. We're going to sow our seed. Might it be a tenth of your income or your first fruits or a sacrifice or an offering? Today you can just take out your seed and we're going to sow it. And we're going to say, thank you, Lord, that you supply. Amen. The seed that I need and the bread that I need to eat. But thank you that you supply. So we're going to give physically. And then at the back, we have a speed point machine. If you want to use your bank card at the back. And then we have the banking details on the screen as well. All those watching by live stream, you're welcome to use the banking details that's, that's available. If you want to, you can take a photo of it. If you want to go and pay something over at home, uh, your tent or some, anything else, we're going to do that. Or the blessing, you're more than welcome to do so. But this morning, we're going to give. And as you give, as you sow your seed, I want just to declare something today. Just because you know something doesn't mean you possess it. But today you need to possess it. And as you give, as you act on your faith, just say, Jesus, thank you that you will supply seed in the season when I need seed. Thank you that you will supply bread in the seasons that I need bread. Will you all do that today? Please, when you give, let's confess that. Let's do that today. And after you gave, please take a cup and take a piece of bread and go and set you with your family. And when you are done, you are welcome to go home. Go and drink coffee. We have new books of Bishop Michael Pitts that was sold out in, in the first couple of weeks. We have some new books. We'll have it available at the back for you to buy. And then go and drink a coffee with somebody. Have a good time with somebody before you go. But today we're going to have communion together after we give. So I'm going to close the meeting now. Anita is going to bless us with a song.
But stay as long as you want. Amen. And if there's anybody that needs prayer, please come to the front. I want to pray with you. And then next Sunday, like we did last Sunday, I gave word to, to quite a couple of people last Sunday. And I feel next Sunday, we're going to use a lot more time to pray for everyone and to give word to everyone next Sunday. So be sure to be here and uh, invite anybody that you can. And please, we also have a, a braai afterwards. Come and join us. We will send all of that out to you on the groups. But come and join us. Be part of it. Get to know each other. Amen. Let me pray with you. Lord Jesus, thank you that this morning we can receive the message that sets us free. Thank you that the law of the Spirit has come to set me free from the law of sin and death. I thank you, Lord, that you are gracious towards me and everyone else standing here. I thank you that as we drink of your blood and eat of your body, that we are reminded that you have paid the full price for our sin, for our sickness, our life of the flesh. And we thank you that there's a new life awaiting all of us, not when we go to heaven, but today, now. And I thank you that we will step into it. Lord, I thank you that today we have an opportunity to give and bless your work and to expand your kingdom. And I thank you for every seed that is sown, it will bring forth a harvest to every family, every business, and every individual person. We bless the seed, may it be fruitful, may it multiply and bring forth a harvest. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you.